Ilya, come here. What do you got for me there? Ice cream. Oh, you got ice cream. What's that? It melted. You know, it's, it's cookies and the cream. Oh, it's my favorite. Oh, it is so good. Oh, it's not completely melted. Oh, there's a nice piece right there. Mmm. Mmm. Oh, I love that. That tastes so good. I, just give me a couple minutes here. Mmm. <laughs> Are you embarrassed? Yes. <laughs> you can't believe your dad's doing this, can you? Mm, in front of all these people enjoying this cookies and cream ice cream. Ah, but, but it makes me so happy. <laughs> Oh, that's probably enough. Thank you, sweetheart. Give her a hand, would you? Ah, oh, that was good. Mmm. Mmm. Well, you ever said, boy, I love this? You ever said that question about anything? Not. First John chapter 2, verse 15. I want us to read this out loud, and then I'm going to read verse 16 and 17. Here we go. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. I'm going to go on to say, For everything in the world, the cravings of the sinful man, the lust of the eyes, the boasting what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Let's pray. Lord, we just ask a blessing on this conversation that you would cause us to know what the Spirit is saying to each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the things we do at our, um, our weekly dinners, and we usually have at least three days or four days sometimes where our family gets you know, at the dinner table. Life is busy. They can't always do it, but we do have these dinners. And, and one of the, the kind of things we do is we, we'll, I'll ask this question. Tell me something new. And then we'll go around the table, and everybody gets to say, you know, something, you know, this is something new. And, and, and nobody can really make fun of it. It just... This is new, and well, uh, my daughter Christine is uh, taking Chinese in, um, in up at Peninsula College, and and uh, she uh, every now and then she'll tell us a new word, and uh, one of the words uh, that she shared recently was when when you when someone does something and it's and and, and you want to compliment them and say well that's pretty good, that's pretty good, you you would say boutsoi. Did I get that right, Christine? Where are you at? She's, not, she's in the coffee shop. I butchered it last time, so she's my perfectionist, you know. <laughs> Boutsois, which means kind of translated uh, pretty good. However, literally, it means not wrong. <laughs> not wrong. And uh, the, uh, the interesting thing, she shared another word once that, uh, and I'm not, I will not try to butcher it, but it, it, you would be said, if you see an attractive woman, you say, boy, she's drop-dead gorgeous. Have you ever heard that phrase? Well, the Chinese have a word for that. However, it doesn't literally translate drop-dead drop dead gorgeous. It translates falling fish and dropping birds. <laughs> you know, when we're driving and squim, the kids know this word well. I, I'll, 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 I'll say this word. I'll, I'll say, oh, we're behind a lollygagger. Okay. You know, some people know that word lollygagger as meaning lazy. In our house, it means slow driver. And I often say it in squim. There are a range of meanings for words. There are ranges. And it depends on its context, its use, and even the subject of the word that would determine what that word means. Now, in 1 John chapter 2, Two, verse 15 through 17, we have a word that is used six times. It is the word world. And if someone does not understand that the English is not the, first of all, the original 
uh, language of the Bible, or they just take that verse without really understanding the context, they're going to think, boy, Christians, they're a bunch of fuddy-duddies. You know? They, you can't enjoy the, the, the world? What is up with that? You know? And, you know, the word world in the original language is the word cosmos. And the word cosmos is used 186 times in the New Testament. The apostle John uses it in 1 John 23 times. And six of those times are utilized in this three ver- these three verses. And so what does this word world or cosmos mean? If you want to understand what it means in these verses, you, you need to understand what it doesn't mean in these verses. And there, there are different, if you want, variations of this word world or cosmos in the New Testament. The, world, the word world or cosmos can mean creation. Can mean creation. The physical universe, the heavens, the earth, the wonderful place that we live, the world, planet earth. It is used in that context. It is used in that use. We find that use in Romans chapter 1 verse 20 when it says, for since the creation of the world or since the creation of the cosmos, God's visible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood for what has been made. In other words, if this verse was referring to the earth, it would mean, you know, don't love what I made. That, but that's not what it means. So it does not mean the earth. It does not mean the universe. Another use of the word is people. Is people. You see, God created the earth and he created people. And before, when he first created in Genesis chapter 1, we see after the first five days, he would begin to, he would end a day and he would say, he saw that it was good. But when he came to humanity, he didn't just say, he didn't say he saw it was good. He went, he blessed them. So God He made the earth and the universe, and he liked it. And when he made man, he liked it so much he blessed man. You see, we don't worship the world, the earth. We enjoy it. We enjoy it. And God created the earth, and he created people. And that word world means people, the inhabitants of the earth, the abode of man. We see that expressed in John chapter 3, verse 16, the famous verse, which I think we should read this out loud and let this let our own ears hear our own voice say these great, awesome words. Here we go. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Let me say amen to that. For God so loved the cosmos. And in this context, it it means people. For God so loved people that he gave his one and only son. God loves people. We are his delight. At creation, he even said that. He blessed us. He blessed us. And God shows his love for us in that while we are still sinners, while we were still sinners, he died for us. He loves people so much that even before they ever existed, he said, I'm going to take care of them. You know, I, I really think that saying God loves people should be said every day. Not just every Sunday. Every day. I heard it said that, quoting the verse out of 1 John, that God is love. 
And then went on to say that he didn't need us, but he wanted us. And that's an amazing thing. Do you realize he didn't need you? But he wanted you. You've been here a while. You've heard me say this. You were a good idea at the beginning of time, and you're a good idea now in the eyes of the Lord. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? See, 1 John chapter 2 Starts off, he said, Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice. He is the one that made it possible, not only for our own sins, but the whole world. This is so important. First Peter chapter 3, it says, Christ died for the sins once for all. This is a, a, a truth that is hard for people to hold on to for their own life, but also for people. Can you think of the person that you dislike the most right now? You don't like them. They're rude, they're mean, maybe they stole from you, maybe they're a complete jerk. Did you know that God, hear this, this can be hard for you to get in your heart. Did you know God has already forgiven them? Already. You see, in a relationship, for it to be whole, Someone has to take the first step. Someone, I always say, has to fall on the sword first. Someone has to forgive. God has already done that. But in order for the relationship to be whole, the other party has to believe that and receive it. Then the benefits of what has been given can be experienced. God has already forgiven that person that you dislike. Can you? Can you? God loves people, even in their awfulness. He loves them. That is, that is bigger than me. That's bigger than my mind can handle. But it is the God that we worship. It is the God that we proclaim here. It is in our nature not to believe this. It is in our nature not to believe this. And when we don't believe it for ourselves, let alone others, we try to fill it with so many things. God loves the cosmos of people. But you know what? This passage is not talking about that. It's not talking about that. God is love and he loves people. Knowing God's love empowers us to love people because life is about relationships. And if I want to enjoy life without loving the world, loving people has become a part of my life, become who I am. And for this reason, I pray for you that God will fill you with knowledge of his will with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. I pray that God would do that for you. You see, the word world can mean creation, it can mean people, but it also means evil. That's the best picture I can come up with illustrating evil. It's just I. You know, by the way, I Googled that. Pick of evil wasn't a pretty sight, by the way. <laughs> Don't recommend it, by the way. Okay. It literally means both physical and moral. It, it also means things that are opposed to the kingdom of Christ. You ever heard of this phrase, if you're, if you're not with me, you're against me? That with Christ, literally, if they're not with Christ... They are in the abode of the cosmos of evil. God loves those people. It really is anything that keeps us from loving God. This isn't a list of rules. This is a reality. Anything that keeps you from loving God 
is this is verses talking about it. First John chapter five, verse 19, uses this word in this context when it says, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world or cosmos is under the control of the evil one. That's a profound truth, by the way. If, if things don't make sense while things are happening in the world around us, well, here's the reason. <laughs> Exhibit A. Okay? And you need to hear this. God hates the evil that comes out of man. He hates it. We see that in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. The Lord hates pride. He hates a lying tongue, the shedding of innocent blood, wicked plans, running, running to do evil, and sowing discord or disunity among people. God hates that, and it, it comes out of people. He hates that. He doesn't hate people, but he hates the evil that comes out of people. So looking at the world or the cosmos and the use of the word, here's a great way to, to express what it means in the Bible. God, first of all, enjoys creation of the world. He loves the people of the world, but he hates the evil of the world. And the last one is what 1 John is talking about when he says, do not love the world. He is talking about the evil of the world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, if we put that up there, he breaks down, if you want to say, kind of the aspects of that. He breaks it down. He shows us what exactly he means. And, you know, it's important that when you look at this, that we understand the difference between the different cosmos use. It's important that we understand. Because if we don't understand, I will never be a mature Christian. I will always be a babe in the Lord. If I don't understand that God enjoys the world, the cre creation, if I don't understand that God loves people, but then I do understand God hates evil, I'm going to be a cranky Christian. I'm going to be a cranky Christian. I'm going to always be going, those people, I can't stand those. Why do they have to act like that? Why do they have to endorse that? I can't stand them. I don't even want to be around them. That is a person that, that understands God hates evil, but they do not understand that God loves people. Now, you also could be a someone who says, uh, you know what, uh, oh, God loves everyone. It's okay that you're like that. God loves you. You can keep doing what you want to do because God loves you. And we turn into this mushy mess that has no anchor in truth, but all our anchor is in our feelings. And we'll never be a mature believer. We may believe Jesus forgave us, but we'll never believe that God called us out of the muck. The fact is, is that I want to avoid embracing a worldly mindset that steals the enjoyment that can only come in a growing relationship with God. And, and if I'm caught in this well, I understand this, but I don't understand that. The, the deception is I may not even know that. And it may be why you're even here today. But the Lord wants to show you, he wants you to understand the distinctions of this. The Bible never gives us a license to hate people, ever. It never gives us a license never gives us a license to be rude to people. It never, there is no reason whatsoever for any of that. 
He has commanded us to love people. And it is only in his love that we're even willing and empowered to do that. When I know he loves me, there is this flow that can come in towards people. But he also commands us, do not love the evil. And that's what this verse is. It is literally a command. Do not do this. Do not love the evil that is in the world. We are called to embrace what God loves and, dis- and reject the things that God hates. We're called to reject it. And you have these three aspects. They're a description of the sinful nature. They are a description of what you would call the flesh. You know, people say, that's my flesh. Well, that, what are they saying? They are saying these things. When I say the sinful nature, the part of me that wants to do wrong, even when I don't want to do wrong. How many know what I'm talking about? Everybody raise their hand, because that's everybody. That's these, the cravings of the sinful man, the lust of the eyes, and the boasting of what he has, and it goes on and says, and done. These three aspects. These do not come from God. He didn't make these. He didn't make us to be like this. But something terrible happened. It was called the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. I heard it said on TV, oh, that's a myth. It was not a myth. It really happened. And the evidence that it happened is that. (laughs) We were not created to be like that. And we needed to be saved from it. So he sent Jesus Christ. And we see at the beginning, Jesus demonstrating that he has the power to overcome that. And he wants to teach all of us to live that way. He's patient with us. And he is tolerant with us. Because some of us take a lot longer to get this. You can rest assured he is patient with you. Because his love is patient. Long-suffering. Aren't you glad for that? But he is calling you out. Calling you up. And to overcoming this. And the interesting thing, you'll live your whole life on that journey. And I, I, I believe this. I believe when you finally reach the pinnacle of, of overcoming this, it's time to go home. It's time to go home. If you're, if you're in the latter stages of your life and you're like, I want to go home, but God is just making you stay, okay? If you wonder why, it's because you haven't totally overcome this. So get about being doing the master's business and find out where. You see, God, this does not come from God. It doesn't come from the Lord. Each of us, each of these things were parts of our being that were lost in the garden. This is our nature apart from the Lord. All of these describe wants, cravings, desires of the soul. St. Augustine, which I... Believe him. He, he believed that these were a consequence of original sin. When sin came into man through Adam and Eve, this is, these are the, this is the evidence and the consequence of it. You see, in Genesis chapter 3, the serpent said to the woman, Do you, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Did he really say that? You know, the enemy will always try to stir up these areas with a question. Is that really that bad? Oh, it's, it's okay. Don't you think it's okay? You know, you deserve that, don't you think? If we're going to enjoy life without loving the world, which is the question. 
How do I enjoy life without loving the world? You know, you need to face a choice. What do you believe? What do you believe? And we have to make a choice. Because in the end, if I'm going to enjoy life without loving the world, I've got to make a choice. And that choice is between cravings of my soul and the grace of God. The cravings of my soul and the grace of God. Now, some of you have lived in the mire of your cravings so long that even if someone mentions this, you get uncomfortable. And the world has made it that way. The system of the world, the world that is controlled by the evil one, doesn't want us to talk about this. They want to try to silence the discussion that evil is bound up in the heart of man. Matter of fact, there's a verse that says man is insane because of these things. The cravings of the sinful man, that phrase, the craving, is the lust and the deceitfulness and the dissension that comes from inside of us. It's the part of me that craves to please myself. Kind of like what you saw earlier with me eating ice cream. I was demonstrating the cravings of a sinful man by wasting all of your time. When you wake up in the morning, what do you think about? What's in your mind? Are they about things that will make you happy? Things that will make you feel good? What's going to bring me delight today? What do I crave? Do you want to make people miserable? Do this. Wake up every morning and say, I must be happy. it won't take very long that you're going to make other people miserable. Because you're going to do what, you're going to begin to do whatever it takes to make yourself happy. And it won't take long before you start stepping on people to do so. To get what you want. You see, that's versus waking up and saying, how can I make God happy? How can I make God happy? Or the Lord may say, how can you make your wife happy? Or your husband happy? Or your boss happy? Or your neighbor happy? How can I help fill in the blank? God's command is to love him and love our neighbor. The cravings of the sinful nature is to love self more than God and my neighbor, whoever that may be. And there's the distinction. And and the, the God of this age has blinded the eyes of the unbeliever and is in control of the world. And in the world, our culture wants to make us suspect that if I dare to infer or tell someone to reject those desires. Even in the church, we are discouraged from saying such things, identifying things, as to become pharisaical or judgmental. There is an aspect of the worldly system that will consider even the words that I am saying as hate speech. Because the worldly system hates where it came from. God himself. You mean, Pastor Mike, you're speaking for God? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I am his herald this morning, his messenger. 
do not love the world. Do not love the evil of the world. The world would say, embrace your desires. Let them define your identity. I was born that way. Well, guess what? We were all born with a sinful nature. We all were. I was. If I want to embrace who I was made, in the sense of in my mother's womb, God created me, but there's a part of me that God didn't make. If I want to embrace that, I wouldn't be standing here. I could think of a lot funner things to do that would please that part of me. And stand up here and tell you, do not love the world. We were all born that way. And depending on our environment and depending on our parents and grandparents, the sins of the fathers are passed down to one generation to the next. I don't know how it works. I do know this, that all humanity was born with the propensity to please themselves. And without Christ, they will take that desire and create an identity around it, whatever it may be. And God says, no, that's not why I created you. I know you were born with a sinful nature, but I want you to be born again. Not by the flesh, but by the spirit. Because there is the answer. God wants us to be full of his presence. Because it's only through Jesus Christ and his, uh, his promised access to the Holy Spirit can we, in fact, learn to avoid this direction. But i got to make a choice. There is hope. You do not have to live in the prism of your sexuality or alcoholism or substance abuse or anger. You don't have to live there. The world says you get to live there. That's a lie. That's a prison. It keeps you from experiencing the fullness of God that he is calling us. And as children of God, as chosen, loved people of God who has been given a hope and a purpose, you have received an inheritance. There must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. The world may live that way, but God, they are not for the people of God. And he wants you, to, you and I to learn through him. Because you can. You can be free. When the world says you can't be, you can. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. I just quoted Ephesians chapter 5 to you. Those are not my words. The Apostle Paul was talking to the Romans in an environment where the cesspool of the sinful nature was part of the culture even greater than our own time. I know that's hard to believe, but it was. You study the ancient Roman and Greek world and your eyes are going to go, whoa. <laughs> it, we're headed there, but we're not there, if you're a student of history, you would understand what I'm saying. The fact of the matter is, is in that environment, this is what Paul said, I want you, that's you and I, to be wise about what is good and innocent of evil. What does he mean by that? You ever heard people say, well, we should go figure out what the culture's like. Let's understand. Let's, let's watch what they're watching. Let's, let's educate ourselves. You know what? That's a bad idea. Because God's will for you is not that you be educated by evil, but to know what is good. I, my parents, I'm grateful, raised us. I was pretty, I was pretty young and dumb with the things of the world, the evil things of the world. So much so, I had a nickname in high school. I, I, at the time, I was so innocent, I didn't even know this was a bad word, it was a derogatory word. They called me Iggy. Ignorant. I was so ignorant to things 
I didn't know. I look, and and I, was, I was made fun of. I look back and I'm grateful for my parents. Because you know what that did for me? Because eventually, as I went into adulthood, I decided I didn't really want anything to do with the church and God. So I began my own way. And you know what that ignorance did? It saved me from some really stupid decisions and I didn't even know it. So I look back and I thank my parents for blinding me from some of the crud that the rest of the world wanted us to know. You know, you don't need to know. I don't need to know what the Kardashians are doing. (laughs) But you know, I say that and then I'll I'll see it and I'll say, well, maybe, you know, Maybe I should know and pray for them. (laughs) Maybe I shouldn't know. I shouldn't know some things about people because I don't want to know now. God doesn't want me to know. He wants our thoughts to be captivated by good things, not by evil things. And let your heart go there. Matthew Henry says this, and this is a powerful statement. A good man will be afraid to speak of what a wicked man is not afraid to do. Oh, I want to be like that. We don't have to be like the world and let the cravings of our souls dictate our direction of our life. You see, it's like candy-coated poison. It tastes good, but it will kill you every time. And so I say to you, my friends, Live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to what the Spirit wants. And what the Spirit wants is contrary to what the sinful nature wants. They are in conflict with each other. God doesn't want you there. He wants you with Him. Who will help us Who will save the wretched man like myself? Praise be to God. Our Lord Jesus Christ has made a way. And in that depiction, in Matthew chapter 4, at the beginning of the sermon, he shows us the answer because the tempter will always be at your door knocking with a question. He did it at the beginning, he'll do it now. Matter of fact, the son of Adam and Eve, Cain, God spoke to him, says, sin is at your door, crouching at your door. You must become the master of it, not it the master of you. Jesus has made that way. When he makes a declaration, if the son of God, you know, he, he basically tells him, eat this, you know, make bread. If you're the son of God, make bread. He's hungry. And Jesus says, it is written, man will not live by bread alone, but by the ver- every word or rhema comes from the mouth of God. And what is the answer is, is in on that point of question when the temptation is, hear the grace. I mean, learn to hear the grace of his voice in your heart. Become aware, become used to listening to the Lord. First through his word, by his Holy Spirit, he will remind you in those moments. It is a power that is not of this world. You do not have to do this on your own. If you try to do this on your own, you will be discouraged and you will want to give up. But God has promised us to help us. That's why the book of Titus says in chapter 2, verse 11, for it is the grace of God that brings salvation. And hear this, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright lives in this age. That is what the Lord has for every one of us. It is a command, do not love the world, but it it doesn't mean don't love creation. God wants you to enjoy creation. He wants you to enjoy. We live in a wonderful place. 
It doesn't mean do not love people. God loves people. But he wants us to hate evil. And it first starts hating that stuff that comes out of me and recognizing I was born with that. But Jesus has given me the path to overcome that. And it may take a while. That, you know what? I can, I'm going to say, that's okay. He's patient. Don't give up. If you fall, get back up. Believe. Make a choice. Now, I, I'm not going to cover the other two today because I, I, I was studying this yesterday. I was like, oh, wow, there's no way I can get through this in one sermon. So I'm going to stop right here. And I'm going to cover the next two next week. Hear the grace of the word of God in your heart. Let's bow our heads. And I'm, I'm going to ask us to pray a prayer together. I'm going to invite the prayer partners to come forward. And I'm going to invite you to pray a prayer with me. A, a prayer that really is a prayer of faith and confession that Jesus Christ is our Savior. But also an invitation that the Lord would help us learn to do this. He would help you learn to do this. And he will help you. He will help you. So I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer with me and out loud. And let's fill this place up with, the word, with, the, with a prayer. And so if you're a believer, I want you to pray with me. I invite you to. If you've never followed the Lord and this would be your first time, or maybe returning back to the Lord, pray with us as we make this confession of faith out loud together. Here we go. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe you are the Son of God. I am a sinful man or person. I receive your forgiveness. I believe you died on a cross and you rose from the dead. You are the son of God. Help me. Teach me to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Help me live a self-controlled life upright in this age. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, you know, I'd encourage you to do one of two things. First of all, in the Welcome Center is a packet that says what's next. In that, some instructions. I would encourage you, if there's a Bible in there, take that and follow the instructions, which include contacting us or come up and pray with a prayer partner. If you have any need to pray for and you would like to pray with somebody, these people would love to do that. God bless you. Have a great week. And tonight, six o'clock, annual meeting, I invite you back to that. God bless you.